Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for the fourth and final event in the Drawing the Line series. Uh, my name is Nikki Barber. I'm Vice President of Seattle Print Arts. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Without the land, we would not have access to this conversation and we thank the original caretakers who are still here. Join us in paying real rent, which goes to support the Duwamish Longhouse and cultural activities. If you are residing outside of Duwamish territory, we encourage you to research the land you're on and find ways to support First People. Links will be put into the chat for you. I'm thrilled to introduce our series discussion facilitator, Cleo Barnett, the Executive Director of Amplifier. Uh, welcome, Cleo. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so great to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nikki, and to Seattle Print Arts for hosting this conversation. Um, and I am so honored to introduce our two panelists tonight, Gabriel Diaz and Money. It's so good to see you. Hi. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, for everyone that's tuning in, um, if you wanna pop in the chat where you're dialing in from, it'd be really great to see where everyone's, um, where everyone's based tonight. And I'd love to just kick us off with um, starting, if you could just give like a very brief introduction about your creative practice. And I know for both of you, it's quite layered, um, but if you could try to just summarize and, and really focus on like what inspires your practice, what inspires why um, you're making art. And I'd love to start with Mun. Hi everyone. <laughs> So happy to be here and be in conversation with those wonderful people. Um, yeah, I am a inter interdisciplinary um, queer Taiwanese Chinese American artist. Um, personally, for me, making art is like really how um, I process the world and experiences that I live in. Um, I'm really interested in the work of um, learning, recording, and preserving the histories of Chinatowns. Um, and I want to do my part to heal the harm and um, of experiences that we experience and also perpetuate in marginalized communities. And um, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. I go next? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is there like a... a thing? Oh, no, okay. Um, hi, I'm Gabriel Bello Diaz. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican designer, um, educator, uh, community organizer. Um, I uh, definitely dabble in a bunch of different mediums, but mostly I like to focus on the collaboration between digital technology and traditional techniques. Mm -hmm. So what that looks like is maybe like incorporating 3D printing in things, um, some laser cutting into like leather. I, I do some leather work as well. Um, a lot of my recent work now has focused on Antisocial, which is a publication that um, kind of highlights artists in the city that are just kind of using their art to give back to their communities in specific ways. Um, and my main, my main mode of work is um, with youth. I feel like that's definitely where a good chunk of my inspiration comes from because they keep me on my toes on what's, what's the now. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so I work at Pratt Fine Arts Center um, as a youth and teen program manager there. Um, and yeah, most of the bulk of our work is just around creating curriculum for kids getting into art on my end um, as the manager. So yeah. And what inspires your practice? Like why, why, what gets you out of bed to do what you do? I think it's, it's definitely research led, especially when it comes to my personal art, because I think a lot of it started gearing towards just using my art to, um, sort of understand my background being Puerto Rican, right? There's a lot of like ambiguity there. There's a lot of like lost um, stories and texts that require a lot of extended research to kind of find out, you know, who my ancestors and who my family were, were like as far back as I can go. Um, so I think it's that kind of cultural investigation that definitely inspires me to do a lot of the work that I do as like an artist myself on my side, um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um... So Man, you were saying that you are focused on um, working in Chinatowns across the United States. I don't know if it's the United States or globally, um, but can you share a little bit about, I mean, for one, like how you started doing that work? I know, you know, like specifically within your art practice and then 
like how you go about working in community? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so I actually grew up in my family's seafood restaurant um, that was in Seattle's CID, which um, stands for uh, Chinatown International District. Um, and that name also pays homage to all of the different um, other Asian labor immigrants who um, immigrated to that neighborhood. Um, as someone who grew up in Chinatown, like my story is also really similar to yours, Gabriel, where um, I just like, I really didn't appreciate or understand, I didn't understand like my cultural identity. And, you know, growing up in schools where you are like really forced to um, assimilate or feel like that's the only way that you can survive in spaces like that. Um, I know that like it left so much harm and leaves so much harm um, continually on all of our communities of color. And so um, I came to realize that uh, Chinatowns were built on racism and that um, they're a d direct result of redlining and um, that like Chinese immigrants and other Asian immigrants were not allowed to um, live or work anywhere else. And so this was a safe haven for us. And for me to grow up in Chinatowns and not be familiar with that history, um, I felt really frustrated and I felt really heartbroken. And I knew that that was something that was really important for me to um, continue that practice and continue to share that story that continues to just be silenced. Um, you know, anti-Asian hate and um, is a result of US imperialism and has been for a really long time. Um, we act as though it's like a very like personal one-to-one um, -one experience when this is, there's a history behind it. And so I feel like it's really important for me and my work to combat that and also to tell my own story as an Asian American person um, and what that experience is like. Well, we so thank you for telling your stories. Your artwork's so beautiful. I'm going to pop a link to your Instagram in the chat. Um, cool. And so when you're working with communities there, like I know you've worked with the Wing Luke Museum and other institutions, is there a way you go about working with people that you're maybe like telling stories about in your artwork? Um, you know, and this is just for everyone tuning in who is interested in working in community, but maybe hasn't yet. Um, is there any insights that you want to share about like how you go about collaborating with communities? And it could be even like communities that you're not a part of as well as this community that you are a part of. Yeah, um, community work is a lifelong process. It's always changing. It's never the same. You are always learning about different aspects um, and how to be in solidarity with different groups of people. And so um, I work with like organizations that um, do work in the CID of like, for example, how do we support um, our um, houseless neighbors? Because they are our neighbors. They're living in the CID too and we have to take care of them. Um, and so I think like, I think that there's always a hesitancy or just like a nervousness in approaching it, but knowing that like you will always be um, a student and a learner that it, it's a continual process. Like, you know, we, um, we share these new experiences together all the time. Um, and personally for me, like to be hearing other people's stories and to try and represent them in the most like genuine light of the way that they have experienced their, their life stories. Like for example, even working with my grandfather and listening to his stories, like how can I um, portray what he wants to say genuinely and what he wants to share with the world too. And so being honest and open with um, sort of what comes your way with these experiences is like, I think is the most important thing is just be open and um, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so powerful. Um, and I know like with my work with Amplifier, I've been really wanting to make sure that there's space at the end of every campaign to really reflect honestly on like what worked and then what didn't work. And, and not that it's anyone's fault. It's more just that you can learn from that experience and then bring it to your next collaboration. Um, and Gabriel, like you've collaborated with people all around the world. I'm so impressed the more I learn about your practice. Like you have been making art in Spain, you've been working in Seattle, you've, you know, you've been working all around the world. And I wonder if there's anything you want to add um, regarding how you go about collaborating in community. 
Um, man, you know, honestly, it's really just, it's really finding this way to trust how to lean and balance. I feel like we always get stuck in these modes where we have to do everything ourselves and not realizing that there's so many beautiful chunks of community that are tackling a lot of the different works. And I feel like it doesn't have to be one issue or the other. It could be all of us kind of having the same conversation, but kind of, you know, expressing it in different capacities. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to my work with, you know, like Pratt, for example, like that's something that that's a place that I feel really comfortable to kind of exercise a moment that I can initiate collaborations. Like right now, supporting Washington Middle School was a choice that I felt really happy about making because I'm like, I'm seeing a school that's right next door to us. Um, you know, there needs to be more support with some of our local spaces. And so being able to kind of flex my positions in some cases that we're able to initiate collaborations because I think, you know, having it be intertwined between, you know, community spaces, you know, industry spaces and then education spaces, I feel like all three of them thrive um, really closely together. And that's just kind of what inspires like a lot of that, like work that I do, especially when it comes to like even the publication, right? Like I wanted to see as many different kinds of artists and um, as many different kinds of representation in antisocial. And it was kind of great to see how every person was able to have their own voice. And then collaboratively, we were coming up with these photo shoots that were, you know, inspired by other local designers. We have one chef that's wearing a garment that's made locally from another designer from down the street that they might not have even known, right? So like kind of curating these uh, moments that we can all just recognize each other and then just leaning right into that. I think mm. that kind of collaboration is always beautiful to me. Yeah, thank you. And you just said something that really caught my ear, which is, you know, providing a platform for creatives to really share their own unique voice. Um, and I know that when we were recently hanging out, you were talking about um, learning about your own history and how that's really kind of feeding into your personal practice. I wonder if you can speak to, you know, why we're all here today talking about the line between inspiration <laughs> and appropriation and how, yeah. how that's um, shown up in your own journey as an artist. Yeah, I mean, like my, myself as an artist, I think is very private. Like it's not, um, I don't wear that part on my shoulder. I think what I push forward is the work that I do with community and the work that I do within sort of balancing these collaborations. But you're right, like my personal art journey was very much starting at, you know, I went to architecture school and I was taking these like architecture art classes and it was like an art history class. And I was like, I'm, I'm here for all this learning about like the history of art. But like, I just realized that like, as I was growing into my own like artistry, like on my own, I was kind of just treating the art industry like this grab bag of things, right? Like I really wasn't taking the time to be like this specific technique that I'm just mimicking and copying, where does that come from, right? I was just doing it because we were just taught like, this is a technique and this is a style and this is what happened during this period. And you're like, great, fine. Let me try to do this like Baroque style or let me try to like get into cubism for no reason or let me think about abstract and surrealist. You know what I mean? Like I can just do that, right? But I wasn't like, what am I like, where is this coming from? Like, where does this style come from? And then even when it came into like learning about the art masters, it's like always just some kind of like, yes, talented, but most of the time for me, like just a mediocre white guy that like happened to have some friends that were like, hey, look at us flexing and doing the thing, right? So like when we're being taught art history, it's just always so ambiguous and bland that it made it feel comfortable to just grab whatever technique and grab whatever visual and replicate it without consequence or without having to really think about where that decision was coming from. Um, and then so I think work like well specifically that, you know, that's really in the forefront of like my work is coming from this story that's really personal that I'm attached to. I just started kind of getting comfortable with that mode of art making since kind of moving to Seattle, to be honest, like I never took a step back and was like, what is being Puerto Rican actually like mean, right? Like, how do I, you know, create these narratives of my background family history with like real research and real documentation, right? So it takes a lot of footwork to do that. And I've kind of dove, in, I dove into um, just researching more about, you know, the, the tribes in Puerto Rico, the Taino and the Borican that are like kind of like part of this Arawak and they're all kind of mixed within like five different islands that, you know, include so many of the Caribbean islands. And just knowing that 
already just opened my mind up. And then like, again, looking at the, the sort of takeover of our island is, it's kind of hard, right? So it's just like, here I am really wanting to research the thing and be like, I want to draw from my own family history. And then being like, wow, these are all the stories of like how we're murdered, how we're like disappearing and how like the documents are like, you know, kind of not as accessible as let's say, you know, tribes out here in the Pacific Northwest. And I've had this conversation before about how much access um, it is from one end of the United States to the other, because it's like, we are left with like putting together ashes to try to figure out what was a past story that holds true. And so it gets difficult when that comes into your artwork. And I think some of that, you know, pain is spilling into like my art right now, as far as like what it's looking like. Um, Cause it's not all pretty, you know, red, white, and blue Puerto Rican bandanas every, like, you know, everywhere. It's kind of just like, this looks a little messy and this looks um, like something that becomes fun investigating, which is why that's that research aspect is what's been really driving me to take my personal art in that direction. Mm, thank you for sharing that and thank you for that brave work and as someone who's followed your art practice through the years now and seen your work from the past I feel like that that personal journey is showing up in a really powerful way in your artwork and I'm so excited to see what you create next yeah okay. thank you yeah um Man, what about you like how long have you been practicing art for and has like your own positionality always been central to the work or is that something that like developed over time? Yeah um so I have always wanted to be an artist ever since I was a kid um I think there was one time where I was like maybe I'm a, like a marine biologist would be cool and then I was like this is not interesting to me I like can't my ADHD is not working for this and so I was like I'm gonna stick with this I'm good at this and so uh, I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. And um, I think it was in sophomore year of college, like I have been, uh, I have always been like trying to build my technical skills. Like that was something that I had always been working on. Um, and I felt really lost in terms of like what I could be making that felt good to me. I didn't feel like I had a style. I didn't have like a technique that I was drawn to. Um, and I think that, there, I, I wanted to do work that felt good for me and something that could like I think when you're like a young kid in like art school you're like I want to change the world but like you're just like a kid you know like you're just like a person and so like what what do you do to like um to heal that or like what can you even do to begin doing that work and um I think that I um I realized that that work had to start with me and that um, before I could do anything else for the people around me and the communities around me that had to start with me um, and acknowledging where, um, you know, a lot of that harm had started for me. And so my very first piece that ever was like identity, identity work was about my family restaurant, was about trying to remember these things and places that, um, that didn't exist anymore um, and have been um, taken because of gentrification and the CID, which is a continual problem. And, um, and so that's where I began to really wrestle with um, a lot of that ideology. And um, I think you had talked about the um, positionality of me and my work. Is that right? Okay. Um, yeah. And so I think in terms of what that separation looks like with me and my work and um, community practice and myself, those lines have blurred completely um, and I continue to um, make work that feels like it can be healing for me it's representative of who I am and all of my like identities as like a queer brown person um, who is like a descendant of immigrants and so um, I think the lines blur because whatever I make and even if it's personal I know that it's representative of the communities that I am a part of. And they are also um, educated by the communities that I'm a part of as well. So I know that there is no separation between me and my community work because even if I'm wanting to do some things that just feel good, like um, it's because of like the world and environment that has nurtured me to be who I am. And so um, I personally don't find any sort of difference with that. 
Mm, that is so beautiful. Um, and, you know, this is now the fourth conversation in a four part series. And I think um, one thing that has come up a little bit, but we haven't really like fully touched on it. Um, and I'm wondering if both of you want to speak to it all. Um, I think sometimes, um, especially like as a white person, like speaking with other white people, I, I feel like sometimes white people specifically, but maybe just in general, like people might feel um, like the idea of cultural appropriation and having to create your own unique voice can feel like a restraint. Like, I feel like some artists just like don't like being told what to do. And they're like, I want to be able to like pull from anything. Um, and so it sounds to me like you're feeling like there's a responsibility in your work, but in that responsibility, you're finding like inspiration and like a direction. And I don't know, do you want to speak to that at all? Um, yeah, do you want to go first, Gabriel? No, I mean, like for me, all right, right? Like, again, not like exploring art, just by myself I've just always been like that kind of artist of like a grab and bag kind of thing of just pulling in references but I feel like what's important that speaks to that is are you acknowledging that you're doing that first of all like are you acknowledging that like you like because then you're starting to go down I think a more positive road of saying that you are inspired versus like I'm just going to straight benefit off of this without even paying homage to like where it came from right and then it's like, let's talk about like your give back to where it's coming from. Like, are you investing back into the communities that are inspiring you, right? If that's not your specific, you know, background, but you're pulling from them, is there something that you're giving back? And I feel like it gets, it gets muddy, especially like when you're like mixed or like when you're, um, when you're unsure on how to be, you know, very direct in saying, this is who I am and this is who I represent. And then this is my work and this is where it's inspired from. And I think as long as there's transparency on like where you're getting your content from, like where you're getting your inspiration from, I feel like you're at least able to initiate a dialogue that mm -hmm. isn't as obnoxious as like, well, I'm just this artist and I'm just the all like create, like I'm not inspired by anything. This all just came from, from these fingertips. And it's like, <sighs> get it? like, just like, is that it? So I don't know. So I mean, like, there's definitely a, like a, a a tug of war for me when when we start narrowing down. I think there's other cases that are very clear on what's appropriated and not, versus others that I think could get a little bit muddy when you start talking about it in depth, especially when it comes to like specific like graphic design or like art art that's very two D. I feel like there's so much inspired art that I feel like could cross that line, that does cross that line. Hmm. Well, thank you for being vulnerable and like sharing your own experience. I know that um, in the panel, when we we're um, talking with Kate DeSisio and Ann Lewis, we we're talking about kind of like the extractive nature of white supremacy and capitalism and how, you know, art artists can feel like they can just kind of extract to consume, to produce, to sell, to extract more. And it just becomes this like cycle that like, honestly, I feel like you... I don't know. I feel like you can feel the vibration of that when you look at the artwork. Like it's not as interesting. Like I think when you start really getting into your own unique positionality, you can feel that. Um, yeah, I don't know, Mom. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, totally. I have a lot to add. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> um, I just want to say, like, you know, we uh going off of what you were just saying, Cleo, um, I think it's really prominent when your work is not genuine to who you are. It's really clear. And like, I think I even see that in my own practice where um, you can see where my work becomes like really who I am. I think you can feel it and see it when you um, are looking at like the time span of my work. I think it's really important that you are being genuine to who you are. Um, and, and I think that, I think it clearly shows in the work um, and I also want to say that, like, you know, white folks, um, the term white people is also like a political identity, right? Like there is, that's an umbrella term where um, white folks who are just assumed white are because of their relationship to power, but recognizing that, like, you know, you're not just white, like you have a background, like white people, like white people have history, they have culture, and you can, you can study that, you know, it's like, yeah. um, why are you not like, why are you not 
looking into your histories and your personal histories when I'm able to, like I'm looking into my own um I've been like force fed a lot of like white history and so um like I think it's important for you to do your own work and I think that like we all have a place and um I think also I want to share like as a person of color when I see like white folks who are um making work that appropriates like Chinese culture it's like a huge reminder that white folks will always have that power to tell you their tell, tell my story over my own voice and mm -hmm. so remembering that harm um and of course there like there are a lot of gray areas and this kind of idea is like really difficult to sort of just like pinpoint um I think it's important to recognize like what you were saying was that like acknowledging where you are and being really transparent about your experience is like out of respect to um out of respect to those people, to yourself and to the people that you are sharing that work with. And so, um, you know, it's it's important to be just genuine to who you are because it's clear in your practices, in your work and um, how you present yourself. So, yeah. No, that's so beautiful. And, you know, it just makes me think about, you know, culture in general, or at least in like Western culture, it's like, we haven't really been taught how to be vulnerable and like even like within the workspace or even I would imagine as a practicing artist it's like you're putting a brand forward like you want to have it be this tidy neat package whereas I think what I'm definitely hearing from younger generations and like what I feel like is emerging is like this um, desire for vulnerability and like being okay with the messiness and like that messiness is what's actually authentic and what people are gravitating towards and hungry for and the more that each of us individually practice that like I feel like we're doing right now it's like I can feel it in my heart and it like opens something up and it brings us closer and not to sound corny <laughs> but seriously I feel like no, we're right, right. for that like healing and like authentic authenticity yeah there can also be a lot of like opportunities for learning like we don't come out of the womb just knowing everything like we're going to make mistakes and being okay and comfortable with that is like a really important part of like being a part of a community you know um and so for example like if you look at like Chinatown Market which is like a clothing brand which is like they have really interesting stuff but it was started by a bunch of white folks and when they were called out their response was that they would they like already established their brand and it would be difficult to move forward so they're not going to change that and so like there are opportunities for growth and change and it's really important to recognize that we can have like transformative relationships with each other and support each other's growth in that way. Well, and we'll just say that like the Washington football team whose name changed this year. Like I remember when I first started working on that campaign, people were like, we can't change the name because it's too expensive to rebrand. And it's like, well, you can change, <laughs> you can yeah. adapt. Um, well, thank you so much. I know this is like an intense conversation, but I love the lightness that you both are bringing to it. Um, one of the questions was, what is the power of speaking for yourself versus someone else speaking for you? And I, I know you both have just sort of touched on that, but I guess rephrasing it is like, what drives you to tell your own stories? And like, what kind of impact do you hope that has on future generations? Um, Gabriel, maybe we'll start with you since you're working so closely with young people. Yeah, I would say, honestly, for me, um, I'm just remembering back when just in school and like, we just all got lumped together as like brown kids, right? Like there was no differentiation between me and the Dominican sitting right next to me or the Mexican sitting on the side. It was just, we were all just lumped in. And then when we talk about, you know, I talk about this a lot with, you know, just being as, as a public school educator about how representation matters and things like that. It's like, I haven't until maybe like this past year just seen um, representation of just a queer Puerto Rican guy like myself from Jersey. Like, what, like what, is, what is that? Who is that story? I don't know, because I'm like creating that path myself. And... I think it would just made the world of difference if that kind of representation was included in my upbringing, right? And so, 
I don't know, it kind of it gets difficult creating that path by yourself. And it's yeah. interesting, but yeah. Yeah, like if you don't see it in front of you, you don't almost know it's possible. Yeah. And so it's been nice, like kind of redirecting my my art in that in that way because I feel like I do feel more confident just as a general person knowing that I'm doing this sort of like self-reflective work that's painful and exciting at the same time, like reading about massacres, but also finding a document that gives me access to my great grandparents name that I never had before. Right. So it's like, there's these positives and negatives that come along with that. But I think it's positive more than anything, to be honest. Right. It's like having to break through a little bit of hardship to, to come to some clarity about identity and, allowing that to spill into your artwork is, is not, is not easy. It, it looks beautiful because again, you are being vulnerable as an artist and you're like, wow, that is powerful. But knowing that that power comes with the artist having to go through that kind of vulnerability to be that exposed, um, I think is kind of the hidden gem that no one really sees. And do you feel like that process is shifting the way you're working with the young people that you're working it with? It is now? because I mean, like the conversations I'm having with them are like, like this kind of conversation here, I could easily have with the kids that I work with. Like they're not scared to dive into, like you said, that messiness because it's like, well, we've been lied to so long. Like we're here, just give us the the raw deal and like, we can handle it. Stop acting like we can't. And I remember me growing up being like, I can handle the truth, right? But like, this is like a whole nother level of them being like, no, just tell us what the, what the thing is, right? And so um, I think that's created classrooms that I've seen with other instructors who are also just as open and vulnerable with their students, create really beautiful safe spaces for them to just be themselves and to allow themselves to be heard and to create curriculum that authentically like actually incorporates their background in some capacity to make them feel like they're being seen in the classroom. Um, I think it's some beautiful work that's happening behind the scenes that is exciting to kind of be a part of. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad that you're in that space working with those young people. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Mon? Like in terms of also just like thinking about, yeah, like legacy and what your artwork, like your artwork as like a portal opening up this potential for this like new way of being in community. Yeah. Um, I want to share that. Um, you know, stereotypes can be really limiting. Um, the idea of the one story can feel really difficult. Um, and I think that there are a lot of like really interesting like gray areas and nuances with that too, where like, I think when I do talks and people kind of ask me like, um, oh, how was like your mom and family when um, you told them that you wanted to be an artist or when you told them that you were queer and it's like I don't like I don't fit the story of having like a tiger mom like I don't and I don't need that to um, you know have my story be like valuable too um, and so I think that there is sort of this like narrowness that happens that is really constricting to who you are where what you were saying where you don't see like this representation of what you needed for yourself, you know? And um, I do also wanna say that when I make my work, like I try to be really clear that I'm describing an Asian American experience, but also it doesn't speak to every other Asian American's experience. I don't speak for everyone else. Like this is genuinely mine because it's always different and I will always respect that. Um, and so I think that it can just be really harmful when you're not, um, able to know that like your story can be told for yourself no matter what it looks like and um uh I mean that goes back to like the genuineness of who you are and how that comes through in your work so yeah yeah that's so powerful and I feel like one thing and please if anyone's tuning in and you have any questions you're welcome to pop them in the chat um but you know, I feel like one thing that's so powerful about right now with, you know, all the social justice, like movement leaders and artists like yourself who are really on the front lines of like creating the culture around you and your community is just challenging the binary system across the board in every single aspect of society. I feel like for so long, we've just, you know, I know I was definitely raised to be like a very specific type of person in the world. And it's just so 
um, gives me a lot of hope seeing how much is opening up for younger generations. And I hope that that like continues to move forward and it's gonna require all of us, including you know everyone that's tuning in right now to just think about like, what kind of legacy are you leaving in your work? Like every single mark you make, every single artwork that you put out into the world is energy that like is going to impact the viewers. And so what is the message that you're wanting to share with your community? Um, well, I have one fun question for both of you. Um, and it's, what is the training that you feel like you're, you've armed yourself with now that you definitely did not learn in school and I'm sure that's many things um but yeah and please feel free to just jump in if either of you have an answer yeah no, go you go. Go. okay <laughs> I was gonna say um there's I think what was really cool but I think really lacked um uh like showing how important it was in in school spaces was that like you know, you have your peers, you have a, a community and you have some of these resources, but I think art school really failed me in like remembering that the world can be so much bigger than that and that your community and communities are vast and um, they're so many and so wide and they are like, no one can do what they do alone. Like we have each other for a reason and we have to have each other for that reason to, to be able to survive and thrive and um, yeah, recognizing that there are resources out of school because I think once we graduate, it's like the world is open and then you are so overwhelmed and scared that like you don't know what to do or where to go. And so remembering that like, I found people like, like you Cleo, where I get to have this community with Amplifier and um, for like this like reach to just expand. Um, I think it's really important to remember that like there's just access to a lot of things and while there are barriers to that we can um, support each other and find each other um, all the resources we need to to be successful in this work. Mm, thank you. I loved everything you said like that was that's definitely spot on. Um, yeah I mean like I just adding a little bit to that would be I think like I was trained that there's like specific structures in a way to go about doing something, right? Like I had to go through these specific channels and portals that were like, you know, how to, you know, contact a company to do a thing or kind of do an outreach. And what I learned was that like none of that matters, like none of it. If I want to work with someone or if I see um, a beautiful community center that's doing something and I want to go to them directly I for some reason I always felt like I needed to just always email info at whatever or you know it just always felt like I didn't have the agency to give myself to be like I'm just gonna just go ahead and go for it and just do it like and like understanding that like there's not this like perfect formula for collaboration like I love like the work that I'm doing right now pulls in like a graphic designer a chef a fashion model and a photographer and I'm like that makes sense to me asked me a couple of years back, I'd be like, no, those are all very different people in different spaces and different art forms that shouldn't be, you know, cross collaborating. And for me, that was like actually the excitement of the work that I do right now is finding ways to mix those, those various industries together. Um, but yeah, everything just always felt like it had to be so rigid, even when I was like being taught like art practices and everything, it just always felt very very demanding that like you could only do it this way because this is the way it's supposed to be and it's like nah like actually we can find our own way to do things in our own way to build and create community and have collaborations that aren't restrictive to these prescribed formats of of other structures that we just I don't know I didn't feel comfortable in yeah totally I, I remember the biggest thing when I was going to art school is like it was just so much research and writing and kind of like talking about the work where I was like, I just wanna go work in community and that's how you learn and that's how you grow. Um, yeah, totally feel that. And so Gabriel, you just brought up a really like interesting point about um, kind of like cross collaboration and bringing together people that maybe wouldn't normally collaborate. Um, can you speak to like any exciting opportunities or any powerful learnings or like growth periods. And it could be through like mistakes or through really powerful collaborations 
um, when you've collaborated with like different BIPOC communities um, that you haven't normally worked with before? Yeah, I say on that end, like I started with a small little like fashion company called Eficio and I was just doing a lot of just like leather work. And I kind of finalized that work or kind of grew into this fashion show called Ancestral Future where I collaborated with two other, there was um, a group from the Macaw Reservation and the people that were running it were, um, were Filipino. And we all kind of had this like fashion show that was like this collaboration of these different, like of our different communities together. And I think that's what really gave me excitement to like actually have a physical space so I had a space in Pioneer Square and I feel like that's where the experimenting and messy part came from. Cause like, you know, how do you open a space that is really supposed like specifically supporting, you know, black indigenous people of color, also the LGBTQAI plus community, but like, you know, not feeling like it's alienating other communities that I couldn't actually account for. So like I was on the third floor with no elevator. To me, I had to like, take a step back and be like, I'm clearly not supporting the disabled community because no, there's no accessibility here. Granted, this is my own house that I'm running this out of. So I felt like, well, I'm just doing the best that I can with what the space that I have. But that was a learning lesson and at least getting some language prepared or some knowledge that like this space is this and it's actually restrictive for these folks. And I need to be really like transparent about that. And like, as much as like, you know, that was my home and I couldn't, you know, just add an elevator into the space, but I still needed to be aware that that was, you know, uh, someone, a, a demographic that I was not including in our space, right? And so I guess like being aware that like, we're gonna be trying to do our best to be as inclusive as, as, inclusive as we can, that we are gonna make, my, make mistakes along the way. And I think me doing that space for a year and I'm glad it's over with and got that out of, my, my lap before COVID hit because, you know, event spaces aren't, weren't really popping last year. <laughs> um, but it was, that, for me, that was great experience and great homework and great work that I think still influences my approach to um, the work that I do right now, as far as just like, if I'm inviting people into a space, am I being as thoughtful and open as I can? And can I reach out to you know some collaborators that help me think even wider, right? And I think that's where the, the beauty of, this interdisciplinary sort of multicultural collaboration really thrives is that we are all bringing something that's very unique. Even um, if we're all sort of representing or checking off the same box, just our personal experiences will be different when we come to the table that I think is just beautiful to, to acknowledge and witness and kind of lean on and know that like we're humans and we're gonna mess up, but like just don't be a trash human messing up. <laughs> Yeah, but you bring up something really interesting too. And I think it comes back to what Mun's earlier point was, um, is like how power, like what role power plays, um, specifically when you're talking about cultural appropriation, but even when you are like curating a space, like you have the power to control the environment. So it is on you to be aware of that and that's even if you're making art, you know, like you have to be aware of the marks that you're making and how that's impacting other communities. Um, yeah, Mun, how about you? I know that you've done like a lot of powerful work, um, you know, around like AAPI solidarity with black lives um, and like, were there any powerful learnings that came through those collaborations? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Uh... Yeah, there was like, um, it, it was really interesting to watch like a, I, like a flood of responses. I didn't expect that poster to um, get so much attention and to be seen so much. Um, so there were a lot of responses around like the harmfulness of like the term yellow peril supports black power. Um, there was a lot of concern from like the Asian community even about um, you know, reclaiming the term yellow peril. Um, and like, it was, it was just like a flood of like a bunch of different conversations that were really important to have. Um, and also was a really good marker of maybe where we were as a collective whole, like where we are um, in terms of like our knowledge around these conversations where, um, where like, for example, we talked about um, 
sort of like centering yourself and centering your own struggle um, in a in a conversation that can be really um, yeah like when we're talking about about black lives like uh, the concern was that we need to be focusing on black lives but also it's really important for Asian folks to recognize our relationship to power to be able to recognize like you know, why are we um, perpetrating a lot of this harm? Um, recognize like that our struggles are completely intertwined and um, we have the same enemy in this conversation. And so um, ultimately it was just a bunch of different conversations that had happened, but, you know, continue to grow my understanding um, and grow like my, uh, like need to do more research and how I can be supportive um, in, in works of like solidarity too. Um, yeah, but I mean, as I was saying earlier, like this is all a learning process. Um, and I think last year was really difficult for a lot of people and for us to be able to have these conversations that can allow for growth and allow for healing was um, something that I'm really grateful for from the last year. No, well, I'm so like proud of you for all of the work that you put out. I know that I was just like looking forward to seeing your work all year and I still love watching your Instagram whenever you release new images, um, new artworks. And, you know, I, I know it is, it's interesting, like as a creator, you don't know how something's going to be received after it's out in the world. Um, <laughs> um and you don't know when something's going to like go viral. I know that we had that experience at Amplifier where we launched this campaign and then literally I had like 10,000 emails a day. And like, I think once you get in that sort of like visibility, um, there are going to be like people who criticize your work and people who love your work. And, you know, I think leaning in to those challenging conversations. And I think for everyone tuning in, like, being you know having a strong group of critical thinkers that are like in your community like I know I could go to both of you and be like hey I'm doing this thing what do you think and I know both of you would be like Cleo yes or like no like and this is why and I think you know you can't I think everyone's opinion is like great information um but to have that close circle that you can be in dialogue with and have those challenging conversations um as, as a way of growth, because criticism honestly is so valuable. Like to know what the critiques are of your work is so valuable. I mean, even in art school, that's like a huge thing, you know, like you get critiqued and that's a huge part of growth. I know it's sad. The first time I Critiques were so hard, but they were so <laughs> necessary. And I, I miss them dearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah, ooh, so there is a, a question coming in in my private DMs right now. And it says, um, what should artists do when they don't have that close circle of criticism that is diverse, especially with artists who operate in white spaces? And yeah, I'm like, I don't even know if this is for you two to really have to answer, but <laughs> if you have anything you wanna share. I mean, like, I'll say just from being new to Seattle, I put myself in spaces that were aligned with my values. And so that's where I, that's where I, I laid my seeds for the community that I have right now. That was going to spoken words, that was going to spaces that, you know, were maybe pop up, like that weren't, you know, maybe just moving around, whatever. But I feel like just me putting my physical self in those spaces um, there came a consistency of other people who were attending the same spaces as me. And then that's where my collaboration, my understanding of community within Seattle really grew from, was just being consistent and being like, these are the people that I just, you know, want to be around. And those things kind of naturally happen for, for me, at least in Seattle. And it was really important to create those boundaries of when it was like, a work related kind of situation or if it's like a friendship thing because I love collaborating with my friends and there's sometimes where it's like we need to lay out a contract like what is what's going on here right mm -hmm. and so knowing your boundaries in in those senses I think are are really um key but I think just being aware of 
that there's so much happening in Seattle that's so beautiful and so many great small spaces that I think when it comes to art and representation within art um, that I can just list off like 20 off the top of my head that I think are just, that's the way to go. Yeah, I like, as a fellow European American, I can step in too and say like, I grew up in Seattle and then I left and then I got, I came back to Seattle um, through my work with Amplifier actually. Um, and, you know, my community growing up was very white because I lived in Seattle. I grew up in Ballard. But when I moved back, you know, I'm, I was very committed to this social justice work. This is my lifelong journey and path. And it's, it's not just my job. It's my, it's my community. This is the work that I'm committed to. And there are so much gorgeous, diverse beautiful communities doing incredible work in Seattle. So I feel like if you look around you and you're only seeing white faces, then like reflect on that. Like that's, you know, that's why, why is that? Um, because it's not just because you live in Seattle. Like there, there's a lot of very diverse, gorgeous communities in Seattle. So, you know, maybe just look at like what kind of art shows are you going to? What kind of community exactly. events are you supporting? Um, because there's a lot of places that you could put your, your money and like go and support and like hear new perspectives. And honestly, like living in New York or living in Los Angeles, it's, you can segregate yourself if you want, no matter where you are in the world. It's really, you know, up to you to surround. I mean, even for myself, it's like a multi-generational community so important. important. I want to be surrounded by elders and I want to be surrounded by young people and you know, that I just, I, I want to live in like a beautiful, diverse community because that's the world we live in. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I lucked yeah. out moving to Beacon Hill first, to be honest. Like Beacon Hill, I think was the best move I could have made coming to Seattle because I definitely found just so many beautiful, small, like little moments that were happening around Beacon Hill. And I, I still like now I'm in Georgetown, but I'm still just like, that's where I really got a good awareness of like, Seattle's not the stereotype all white Seattle because that's, again, it just depends on where you're putting yourself. Yeah, I wanna add like, um, I mean, you guys handled that question perfectly, but yeah, I just wanna add that like community building and relationship building is a long process and um, you choose who you engage with and there are so many cool things happening in Seattle that um yeah you will find your way for sure and um yeah and choose to invest in like transformative relationships for yourself and the people around you um and yeah just there's really amazing people in Seattle you just have to you know find find your way to them yeah, I agree. And if anyone is interested in resources, I'm sure we could follow up with an email with like incredible resources. Um, all right, well, we have time for about one more question. Um, I would definitely love to learn more about like how we can support your work and if there's anything new coming up. Um, but before I do, I just wondered, is, is there like a story, you know, and this is an on the spot question. So if you don't, if nothing comes to mind, that's okay. But is there a story that comes to mind that really stands out from you that was like sparked by your artwork? So like for Mun, for instance, was there like an artwork that was created and then a response to that artwork that really stands out to you and that kind of grounds you on your journey? Yeah, um, I'm going to be kind of annoying about this but someone asked me a question where um they asked me what the what my favorite part of art making was and um I I think it was really interesting to listen to other people respond to that question too because for everyone it's different um and for me I really believe that like having that interaction with um people and the audience who views my work that is my favorite part of art making. And that's when I feel satisfied. I feel like I like ate a whole meal and feel um, rejuvenated because um, for example, like when I make work about my grandmother and, and that work is really intimate to me, making work about the food that um, we had shared and about her life experiences and 
how much I tie like my identity to a lot of food. Um, and, you know, there was this person who came up to me um, and talked about like seeing my, my work and then telling me their own stories about their grandmother and the ways that like they identified their identity with, um, with like their culture's food. And I feel like that moment of shared experiences, oh my God, puppy. <laughs> <laughs> um but like having shared experiences with each other is so humanizing and so like um it just builds such a beautiful connection that I will always want to have for the rest of my life I always want to connect with people and I always want to be able to trade stories in that way um and so I think that's what makes me feel um yeah just like very like loved in a in a really specific way um and so yes that's that's my answer <laughs> <laughs> oh I love that so much thank you so much um um I was really trying to find like an alternative but I I really want to say right now because there are several artists who who do this for me right and I just feel like I have the opportunity to give Mona a shout out because your work has definitely influenced me and my growth specifically especially when I saw a lot of your work revolving around food because I was going through a really heavy time with you know looking at my art through the lens of like the horrors and atrocities of Puerto Rico and I'm like this is heavy and it was just like it was just so heavy for me to like continuing looking at my culture through this like historic lens and when I saw your work emerging that revolved around food I felt like it was such a, a more uplifting way to dive back into my history that reminded me about stories of my grandmother and meals that we would have together and like things that were like really personal but also like very much like hello Puerto Rican and I was like this is like a, a di this is like here's a di here's a direction that I just loved seeing that just gave me like positive influence on continuing doing the work that I was doing so I just want to I like seriously thank you for that because like like no lie like your work has been that for me wow thank you thank you so yeah. much for sharing that y'all are gonna be sure like, <laughs> just like, oh. but, like that's the power of having an authentic voice and not just copying and appropriating but like really going inwards and like that spreads like so truly it definitely Aww. spread this way like thank you <laughs> um no, that was like again uh, there's a lot of artists whose work does that but when you're in the middle and like you're in this sort of art funk and you're just like kind of angry and frustrated and you're not sure where to go, like having an artist like yourself to just be like, breathe, like here, like just here's a whole ass other direction that you can be looking at this kind of work and doing your own personal investigation, your own personal stories. That was just so beautiful and it was such a relief. It's like I had the best like cracking of the back, like just relief moment. Um, that was really beautiful to, to experience. So thank you again. Um, can I add something before we go? I just want to say, like, um, I feel what is so liberating about people telling their own stories is like watching um, when you watch people who represent an experience closer to yours than like other white folks. Like, I feel like it gives you permission, like giving others permission to be who they are and to be able to tell their own stories is like the one of the most healing things I've ever experienced and um yeah and I I think like it's really valuable and really um I just I feel so warm and I think I'm gonna go cry into my dinner after this call so thank you so much for sharing that yeah, of course. Thank you. And Gabriel, <laughs> just to keep the uh, compliment circle going, there's a comment in the chat that you should read, um, sparked by what you just said. Um, and as you read that, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Seattle Print Arts for creating this space. Um, I've never been like given this much space to talk about cultural appropriation and to go through this healing journey with so many incredible artists that I respect from all across the country. Um, thank you so much for everyone that has been tuning in. You know, like it shows like a, a real dedication to, to growth and being in community. Um, and Nikki, I don't know if you wanna 
pop back on the video. Um, but I thought maybe like before we sign off on this last um, last panel, um, I'm gonna take a little selfie of us on our screen. So if you guys wanna oh. smile. <laughs> Okay, hold on. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> um, but thank you so much to everyone at Seattle Print Arts and for Mun and Gabriel for closing out the series with us. And yeah, just really an appreciation of um, just the, like, I've been a part of quite a few panel conversations and there's just so much intention um, that was put into this one particularly. So just shout out to Seattle Print Arts. You all have a really beautiful community. Yeah. Back at all of you guys, I am not a crier. I'm starting to feel a little misty. Um, it's just really beautiful hearing you speak and I appreciate it very much. And I, I think I can speak for the, the text thread that's flowing from the Seattle Print Arts people. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and for everyone who's here, um, invite you to participate in our discussion group with Seattle Print Arts uh, next Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, all registrants will be emailed and um, yeah, hope to see you there and just thank you so much. Um, this is our final artist conversation, like Cleo said, and drawing the line, influence, inspiration, and appropriation. Thank you everyone so much. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye, yeah. Bye everyone.